Hello. It is February 13, the birthday weekend of social reformer, abolitionist, orator, writer, and Washingtonian Frederick Douglass. Born into slavery, Douglass celebrated his birthday February 14, but because he has a significant connection to today's subject of the virtual experience, I'm gonna say happy birthday, Frederick Douglass, one day early. I'm Carolyn Crouch, the founder of Washington Walks, a DC-based walking tour company that's gone virtual during the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you for joining us for the second of three Washington Walks virtual experiences that honor Black History Month. And today we are going to have a symbol of Black achievement, the Recorder of Deeds buildings. I couldn't be happier to be joining today with DC Preservation League colleagues, Peter Sefton and Melissa Loriano. DC Preservation League is, as we're talking about Black History Month, an important organization to preserve and celebrate and interpret Washington DC's Black built environment. And this building, the subject of today's presentation by architectural historian and DC Preservation League trustee, Peter Sefton, is a very important symbol, as our title says, of Black achievement. And Melissa is an employee of DC Preservation League, and she's gonna talk at the end of the presentation about how you can be part of this organization, this essential organization to maintaining our historic built environment in the nation's capital, our hometown, how you can support the work of this all important organization. So welcome Peter and welcome Melissa. And let's see, Peter, I'm gonna turn on your video. There you go. Hello. Hello, uh, thank Hello. you, Carolyn. Uh, hopefully you can see the first slide there. Well, what I'm about to do is, I'm gonna put the first slide up, make it look perfect. And I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna make you, as we've all been in Zoom enough to know that I'm about to make Peter the host. And he is now gonna be able to operate his own slide deck <laughs> for his presentation. So Peter, um, I'm familiar with this building. Thanks to your organization, I've been inside this building, but I bet a lot of folks who are joining us today probably have never been inside and they may not be in front of it, but probably lots and lots of people have walked past this building, especially if you have to do any business with the DC court like jury duty, right? Yes, that's absolutely true. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a funny thing when you think of this building and, uh, you know, in, in getting ready for today, Carolyn, I was thinking, you know, I really miss getting together face to face with people as we all do. Uh, I have to say that on a, you know, a cooler, you know, windy winter morning like this, Zoom and touring the building from around the fire is kind of attractive too. <laughs> uh, and in other ways, seeing the building by Zoom is really probably about the best possible way to do it these days. Uh, you know, like you're saying, if, if you've lived in Washington for maybe 15 years or more, the building doesn't need quite so much of an introduction. If you're a little newer to the city than that, uh, you know, you've probably never really been inside of it and it's a little bit of a mystery to you. As you walk by, it's an attractive building. You kind of read it as a government building, I think by its architecture, but it's a mystery. And if you look at it closely on your way to the courthouse, nobody's ever coming in and out. Um, that's odd. Why is that true? <laughs> right. Yeah, and why is this building important to Washington DC and Washington DC black history? Uh, well, that's because uh, it's for quite a few reasons. One of them is, and I don't know if you can see the slides at this point or. Yeah, we can. You can, okay. And yeah. uh, I'll put them on slideshow. Maybe that would help as well. Is that better? Oh, uh, well, let me see here. 
you know what? Um, I think that I need to, can you, I think we had such a good plan in place that Peter was gonna run his own slideshow, but I think because I'm sharing my screen of the slideshow that I may have to do it. So sorry, folks, this is one of those Zoom moments. Um, but well, Zoom is a voyage of discovery for us all. <laughs> it is, hold on one minute. It is a Zoom discovery. Okay, can you, I know people are probably in the chat. Yes, I don't see the slides. We've all had our Zoom moments, people are saying. That's, thank you for being patient and kind. All right, I'm gonna try this. Peter, why don't you now try sharing your screen of your slideshow? Okay. It's gonna look a lot like the one I had because I had Peter's. Right, let's see. Uh... All right, I'm going to hit share screen here and hopefully this is going to be good. Hopefully this is going to work. Fingers crossed. Um, fingers crossed. Yes, always. And uh, all right, there we go with share. I'm seeing it. All right. All right. Another technology problem solved here. Yeah, so now if you just click on, I think it's slideshow up there at the top of your top, sure. PowerPoint, kind of in the middle. Yeah, there we go. And then from the beginning. There we go. Just like in the sound of music. Oh, yes. So everybody hopefully is seeing the recorder building here. Yeah. Seen by the dawn's early light. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so you know the, the building we're talking about here. And uh, as we say, you haven't seen anybody go in and out in quite a while. And uh, we're gonna talk about why. But to answer Carolyn's question uh, about- uh, Yeah, why it's important to us. Why it's important to us. And I'm having a little trouble advancing the slide, but uh, let's see, one second here. Huh. There you go. There we go. Okay. All right. We got it. Just just a little computer hiccup. Uh, it's really the building is very strongly identified with the struggle of African Americans for political and social rights, because for decades the position of recorder of deeds was given to prominent African Americans from all over the country, uh, and it became a national symbol really in the late nineteenth and really up, you know, really, really all along afterwards in the 20th century of political achievement and uh, of the importance of African-Americans to, you know, the political process. Um, building the Recorder of Deeds building in 1941 to 1943 was a very important symbolic step because it really made very, you know, literally made concrete the importance of African-Americans in the New Deal coalition and in the political life of the country. So it was a really a very major symbol. And it was done, it was built at a time of great external threat, World War II. And, you know, very much comes out of the uh, sort of ethos of everybody pulling together, even uh, a group that did not have remotely equal rights at the time and still doesn't. Um, so the buildings kind of represents the beginning of a victory over racial discrimination and prejudice. Uh, that uh, carries on from the early days of the recorder's office. And it's very unique. It's a very unique building because of the artistic program within it, which we're going to take a, a visual tour of, that uh, it's, it's the only uh, program of architectural art in a federal building that's devoted to uh, African-Americans' role in American history. I thought with this slide, we might start out just to show where the building is and get everybody oriented. Uh, if you don't know, it's right across the street from the uh, Moultrie Courthouse there on Indiana Avenue, just up the block from police headquarters, kind of next door and up a block from Old City Hall. And it's a, it's a if you haven't been down there, it's a very quick walk from the Judiciary Square Metro Station. Yeah, and, and also um, um, Archives Navy Memorial. I bet a lot of people use to get up to here as well. 
Yes, that's Park true. Along Indiana Avenue there. Yeah, it's very centrally located. So if you, if you haven't walked by, you can at least see the exterior of it, which you know has its own architectural charms, but it's not the main story. So what's its um, what's its current status? You've mentioned nobody's going in and out of it anymore. Yes. Well, here we get a little different view of the building, and um, it it basically it, it was built 1940 to 1943, and it was constructed as a DC government building by the Office of the Municipal Architect. Uh, it it is so it seems very strange to say today, but at that point, of course, the district didn't have its own elected government. There wasn't a mayor. There wasn't a city council. The district was ruled by a, by a triumvirate of three commissioners who were appointed by the president and didn't necessarily have a whole lot to do with Washington, D.C. They were political appointees at the national level, and they were confirmed by the Senate. So people, people who lived in Washington, really, they, they couldn't vote for anybody. And it was built by the district government when the district government was a, a department of the federal government, really. And it was in use, very active use, up until the early 2000s. And then in about 2008, the recorder's office moved out and the building was mothballed. And today we say it's used for storage, but it, it's, it, it has frankly been almost an abandoned building that does have some artistic treasures inside. Uh, so it's, it's, it's definitely a rather, as, as we'll sum up, a rather neglected property. What and does the recorder of deeds do? What is that function for the district government? Well, what the recorder does is um, basically is the recorder is when you know when you when people talk about when they buy a house getting the deed down to the courthouse and recording mm -hmm. things in the district as well as a lot of major cities that's conducted by a separate office called the recorder of deeds. Basically the recorder is the official repository for uh, a wide range of legal documents, uh, property deeds, most particularly, but also in corporations, mortgages, powers of attorney. There have been a great many different types of legal documents that basically, uh, you know, assert rights or they're about control of property. Uh, the, the recorder doesn't handle wills. That's done by a separate office. But uh, the recorder has done this since the 1860s when uh, the position got started. And so they have, they have deeds that go back. They have deeds that survived the burning of Washington in 1814. Wow. It's, it's a priceless uh, archive. Today, a lot of the older deeds and things are actually at the DC archives over in Blagden Alley. And the recorder retains the more recent ones. So what's the building's relationship or the recorder position relationship to African American history? Uh, well, the recorder's position has a very long association with African American history, and it kind of, it's, it begins really kind of at the at when the re position was created at the time of the Civil War. Uh, you know, at the Civil War during that decade of the 1860s, the district's population virtually doubled. Then it declined a bit after the war. Of course, a, a lot of the population increase were. Uh, African Americans who had fled from the save, slave owning states during the Civil War had come to Washington and settled and were getting a foothold in the city and in freedom. And so there was, the, these things were all happening at once. And the system of property in the city was just chaotic. Like nobody could tell who owned what. And, you know, people were building houses every which place. And, you know, so the Congress decided things needed to get systematic. And during the war, they created a position called Recorder of Deeds, but it was pretty unclear what that position was going to do and how they were going to do it. It was, you know, kind of a stopgap solution. And after the war, they systematized the position a lot and created a powerful official called a recorder. Uh, the first three recorders were white. Uh, the first was a man named Simon Wolfe who, you know, basically when President Grant wanted to appoint him to the job, took a look at it and said, uh, you know, I don't think so. And then he heard that people were opposed to him getting the job because he was Jewish. And he, he got back with Grant and he said, no, you know, I want the job. I'm not going to give in to these people. I'm going to, I'm going to do the job and, you know, do it well. And, you know, I'm not going to knuckle under. And he was a very successful recorder and he held the position uh, about eight years. And then he was followed by two other white recorders. And then 
when James Garfield became president, Garfield was a kind of a tragic figure because he served for such a short time. Of course, he was assassinated in the railroad station at the mall. Right. But during his brief time in office, he made a pretty, compared to his predecessors, certainly a big effort to uh, appoint African-Americans to important government positions. And I think that's why on this particular uh, chromolithograph banner from uh, the Library of Congress, you see Garfield's picture in the, yeah, yeah. the, board, the border as someone who did make an effort. And he selected Frederick Douglass, who had been uh, chief deputy marshal to take over the job and kind of get the office, uh, you know, even running even better than it was. Um, so Douglass was the first uh, African-American recorder. And he inherited a, a staff that was, uh, it, it, it did a great many things, but one of its big functions was if you had a deed, you would bring it in to have it recorded. And there was no way to copy things except in longhand. So the recorder's office had a staff of copyists. And what they would do is they would copy your deed into these big ledger-like books called Liebers. And then it would be stamped and certified and become your official deed. And the, the Liebers would stay in the possession of the recorder, of course. And the copyist charged by the word and by the page. The recorder got two thirds of the fee and the copyist kept one third. And then the recorder used that money to run the office and was compensated by the difference between what the office took in and the, uh, you know, the, the, the fees. And so it, it was, it involved managing a staff of about 30 or 40 people. And Douglas- Was it a, uh, was it a multiracial staff? It was, it was, it was a state, even before Douglas became recorder, there were African Americans on the staff, and they included uh, they they functioned as copyists, as did many of the white employees, and the staff was about two thirds women, and uh, it was almost equally divided between African Americans and whites. So it was, especially at the times, a very diverse staff. And how did that go? Do we know about um, if there were any? Is there, a, is there a pushback on having a black man supervising a multiracial staff and particularly a staff that might include white women? Are there any kind of you know, racist attacks? Well, the answer is yes. And it was a very shameful and nasty uh, attack, you know, whole universe of attacks. And it went on all throughout uh, Douglas's term and really the subsequent recorders because after Douglas, it, Douglas's appointment, he was very successful as recorder. Uh, the position was generally just by general agreement between the two parties allocated to an African-American. Um, and Douglas, well, as you see here with the quote, very ugly quote, was subjected to, he was at this point when he got the job in 1881, a national hero. And, you know, he held it for five years and you know, he was subject to attacks throughout. And they were like this, uh, you see here from the Washington Post, that they just simply because he was an African-American, he was not considered by a lot of people fit to be a recorder. And it, it went on, there were very ugly ones, which I didn't really choose to show, personal insinuations about him, his honesty, his marriage, his character. And this went on and it happened every time the recorder position changed hands. And generally it would change hands when an administration changed. Uh, and it was a very, very ugly series of uh, events. And, and they did, um, there, there were a lot of reasons uh, for this. One was that uh, the recorder position was very, very lucrative. The recorder made a lot of money. In fact, after Douglas was recorder, he, he said that the recorder position was the best compensated US government position besides president. And so a lot of people wanted to be a recorder and they would do anything to try to get the job. Uh, another thing is, Carolyn, as you've said, uh, that the position was very unique for the times and that it involved an African-American uh, supervising white employees, just something you generally wouldn't see. Uh, Douglas had, had a white deputy who did sort of try to subvert him apparently and you know, we tried to overthrow his successor, but didn't succeed. Uh, and in fact, lost his own job for that. And then, uh, 
I'm wondering what happens, what happens when Woodrow Wilson comes into office because he segregated the government and had a terrible impact on black middle class life here in Washington. He did, and the recorded position was not an exception. Basically, when Wilson took over, at that point, uh, Douglas and I think it's, he had had about eight successors, had all been African American, and Wilson was strongly lobbied by uh, members of the Democratic Party in Washington, which is, of course, Wilson's party, to appoint a white recorder, as you see from these newspaper headlines. And they enlisted con con congressional representatives, including uh, a segregationist named Vardaman from Mississippi. And their argument was that it's a home rule issue. Uh, the recorders uh, appointed by national political uh, leaders, confirmed by the Senate, you know, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. We don't want that anymore. We want to have a local District of Columbia person. We want home rule. And of course, because of our preferences, that would be a white person who's a district resident. So the home rule thing was kind of, it, it was not exactly quite a front, but it was very tied up with the racist idea that the recorder had to be white. And uh, it, Wilson listened and he appointed a white recorder named John Costello, who was a National Democratic Committee man. And Costello served throughout Wilson's administration. Uh, you know, he did not do a particularly bad or particularly good job by most by his reputation, but Wilson gave in. And then how about what happens, um, Warren Harding? What does he do? Well, Harding uh, was a Republican, of course, and uh, he basically fired Costello and he appointed an African-American lawyer named Arthur Fro, And that uh, reinstituted the tradition, the bipartisan tradition of having the recorder position given to an African-American. At this point, the recorder of deeds is still, it's considered to be, they're, they're considered to be like four major government positions that African-Americans were appointed to. Uh, two of them were diplomatic positions. They were ambassadors to Haiti and the, the island of San, Santo Domingo. One was register of the treasury, which was, uh, you know, kind of, a, it was an equivalent position to like the comptroller of the currency would be today. And the third was the District of Columbia recorder of deeds position which made it really, it was, it was about the only municipal position in the country that was a federal job. Wow. So it was, it was a big, and the, whatever the recorder did, got national attention in the African-American press. Wow. And so, so showed, big job. Um, yeah, the photo that we saw of the current <clears throat> building, that's built in 1941. Where did the function occur before 1941? Well, the answer is all over the place. Uh, the recorder was performing an essential function for the district and you know everybody knew that and accepted it, but it, it, it was a homeless office really. It bounced around and it was an awkward situation because it was a pretty big staff of copyists and clerks and it had these tremendous library of these leapers as they call them, like these ledgers which weighed like they could weigh 20 pounds each if you ever go down there and have to heft one, it's, it's, it takes both hands. And they, they had hundreds of them. And so they, they, the staff and these levers were floating around. They had various offices in old city hall. They got bounced out of city hall occasionally and they got put in leased office space around Judiciary Square. Um, in 1908, when the district government mostly moved out of old city hall, which is the current DC courthouse, and went over to the district building, the recorder's office couldn't go because its work was very connected with the courts and it couldn't be that mm -hmm. far from the courts. So they were marooned. They uh, were, were in for a long time, a lot of the district government that didn't fit in the district building was in the Walker building, which was kind of, I think, where the police headquarters is today. It's at fourth in Louisiana. And it was hot. You can see in this, this is a picture taken in the spring and you see all the windows are open. It's not air conditioned. Right. It's like the sweltering building and the, the deeds were not secure. That was every recorder complained about that, that, you know, it, it, it you know, they were trying to keep track of the, of the books, but sometimes the staff was in a different building than a lot of the books. And they had little fires. They had a couple of ones that really could have destroyed the property records of the city. And 
the recorders would plead with Congress because remember, there's no city council to get money from. Right. Look, we need we need to do something here. We're a disaster waiting to happen. And Congress, you know, said, yes, you're right. You are a disaster, but we're not giving you any money. But that changes, doesn't it? It did. It did. They get it, the purpose it, building. it did. The, the Walker building is no longer around. And here's why. Uh, under Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, a remarkable leader became recorder of deeds, Dr. William Tompkins. He was a former hospital superintendent from uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and he was a civil rights uh, activist and civic leader. And Dr. Tompkins was a very, very efficient and savvy person. He had run a major hospital. He, he was used to, he was a businessman in addition to a doctor. And he was a very, very astute handler of Congress and uh, public relations, as we'll see. And Dr. Tompkins is really the force behind the Recorder of Deeds building and its art program. Uh, but what happened really with, with accomplishing this idea was in 1926, Congress under Calvin Coolidge announced they were gonna build the uh, Federal Triangle, which would be uh, over here in this, this view. And to build the Federal Triangle, they're gonna tear down about 10 square blocks of the city. I mean, this is major. They're gonna wreck a whole bunch of district government buildings and office spaces the district government rented. And they were even gonna take the district building, which was almost new, it was only about 25 years old, and tear it down because they felt it just wasn't up to snuff to be a federal office building. And so the district commissioners at that point got pretty upset. And they, they were all Republicans and Congress was run by the Republican party under Coolidge. And they said, well, we need our own campus. This is ridiculous. You know, we don't, our courthouses are out of date. What are we gonna do? So Congress said, yes, what you should have is you should get these squares between Pennsylvania Avenue here on the South and Judiciary Square up here on the North and bounded roughly by uh, Sixth Street and uh, Third Street really. And that, that can be the municipal center campus. And you know, you can, you can build a municipal center there and we'll, we'll pay about half of the price, but you have to come up with the other half. And by the way, we're not gonna give you our half. <laughs> at that point, the district committee, which gave out money was run by conservative Republicans from the Midwest basically, who they were into cutting government. I mean, they weren't looking to build, you know, a thousand miles from home to build a municipal center. Right. So there wasn't a lot, a lot of money put to the project. And as you see, each one of these little pink rectangles is a building that had to be bought from its owner and torn down. So the, the project didn't go very fast. Uh, and they started in 1926. They did, by 1930, they were tearing down buildings, but by then the depression hit, was on. And uh, you know whatever money the district was getting from Congress was just being reprogrammed to unemployment relief just to keep people eating. And as, as the New Deal took office in 1932, there was more money put to these things, but gee, it, it, there was a feeling the district is getting its share of federal money and we've got the whole rest of the country to worry about. And besides, you know, you can't vote. So, you know, it shows you where we are. But then in 1936, as Carolyn pointed out, uh, a, a female representative from New Jersey, Mary Teresa Thompson is known as Battling Mary because she was pretty prognacious, became chair of the district committee. And she decided and won assent from the Roosevelt administration. Okay, it's time to do something here. We're all suffering. We've got to do something, at least with the courthouses. And she kind of teamed with the municipal architect who you see caricatured here, Nelson or Nathan Wyeth, to design a municipal center. Uh, very briefly, Nelson, Nathan Wyeth was a very, has so much to do with the look and feel of the city. He started building fancy mansions in the early 1900s. Then he did a lot of government work. He did the original Oval Office of the President. That was his idea. He did the Tidal Basin. He designed the Key Bridge. He designed a lot of the city hospitals. In 1930, he was ready to retire, but the stock was 65 years old or so. But the stock market crashed and he lost all his money. So he had to go to back, back mm -hmm. to work. And he went to work for the city. Uh, he inherited the job of municipal architect when the municipal architect died. And he built really all of Washington's great 
civic buildings of the 1930s. And wow. he deserves a lot of recognition. And you know what? I think Mary Norton deserves a lot of recognition. What an unsung hero for Washington, D.C. at this time. This position on the district committee. I also love imagining that she is doing this work in the Congress at the same time as Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, first female cabinet <clears throat> official, is doing all the work on the New Deal. Absolutely true. And I, I don't think it could have happened without either of them. Uh, and it's, it's a very sort of poetic justice that today the Municipal Center, uh, which is so associated, so associated with Norton, is right next door to the Francis Perkins yeah. Department of Labor Department Building. Labor Building, yep, it is. Their neighbor, absolute next door neighbors. But yes, it was, you know, as, as it conveys, the building of the Municipal Center was quite a team effort. And, but these are two people who deserve all the, you know, not all the credit, but an awful lot of credit. So, did so we anyway, get, this is... Um, okay, yeah, I was going to say, did we get the whole Municipal Center? I don't think we did. No, we certainly didn't. This is the Wyeth's final plan for the Municipal Center. It was not fully accomplished. Uh, this is Old City Hall, which is the basis of it. Here are the Judiciary Square courthouses. Fortunately, Wyeth was not allowed to tear down the National Building Museum and build a new armory there. And um, he did get to build one of the two municipal center office buildings, which today is the Daily Building Police Headquarters, which is number four. He did not get to build the other module of, of the municipal center, which is now the Moultrie Courthouse site. He did get to build what was one half of the new city library which was a very nice building. We only got to build half of it and that's torn down. It's now the site of the Canadian embassy. And he did not get to build the new municipal auditorium, which today is the federal courthouse, the Prettyman courthouse. He did get to build a building here, which at the time in 1939 was not allocated for the recorder of deeds, but that uh, yellow rectangle is the site that the deeds building is on. What happened was this was the original site of the DC police court. And when Wyeth built the new police court over here in 1936, the police court got to move out of this building, which was totally obsolete. It didn't have ladies rooms because it predated when women could be on juries and they had to very clumsily retrofit them. So that was torn down and that opened up a spot for the deeds building. And Dr. Tompkins lobbied, he, he went to the public and he said, well, you know, the, the, with it, in its current home, your deeds just aren't safe. And a lot of them are signed by like Daniel Webster and very famous, they're valuable autographs. People are going to start stealing them if we don't have a fire first. Why don't we give all your deeds to you? You can take care of them. You can put them under your mattress. You can put them in your safe deposit box. You can do whatever. They'll be safer than they are with us because we can't, the Congress isn't letting us take care of it. And that made a big civic outcry. And Congress knuckled under and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna fund a, a recorder building. And it got done in that way because of that approach. So they're finally then able to break ground for a purpose built recorder of deeds building. Indeed they did. And it was a big ceremony. Franklin Roosevelt came himself and you see him in this picture here, Dr. Tompkins is to his left and uh, Evangelist Michaud, who was a very major uh, radio evangelist at the time, is giving the invocation. This is in September 1940. So we're about a year and a few months out from the beginning of World War II. And that, that throws a wrench into the process quite a bit. First, there were some strikes. There were some jurisdictional strikes between the AFL and CIO workers on the building site. And in fact, as soon as Roosevelt pushed a button to dig the first, make a steam shovel dig the symbolic first hole, uh, the union shut the job down and they took the steam shovel away. And eventually it came back. But by the time they really got going with the construction, the war was on and materials were in very, very short supply of, at all. Like you couldn't get concrete, you couldn't get steel for the windows of the framing of the building. Big struggle to put the building together. But they did, and it took two years. It took about a year longer than anticipated. But in 1943, the building was there and ready. And it, it's a handsome building. 
even with all the wartime restrictions, uh, it, it's what was called a stripped classical style, uh, in which it, it, it seems like it's not very detailed, but, um, oh, sorry, it, um, the window ribbons kind of make these areas in between them seem like columns mm -hmm. uh, would be in a classical building. So it's kind of very stylized columns. It does have ornamental cornices and around the entrance, like you see these, the limestone is carved to represent, to suggest at least pillars. And you have across the top, you have this frieze of wheat leaves or wheat, wheat sprouts, which is also on the, the cornice up here. So it, it, it's sort of becoming almost a modernist building, but it does have ornaments. And it's, it's under the constraints the office of the architect is working on. It's a handsome building. And I bet they achieved fireproof building. They did, because in the building, as you see here, uh, or you don't actually see here, it is basically just three above ground and one or four above ground, really, and one below ground stories. The basement level is fireproof vaults to keep those levers in. The second floor is the recorder's office and other manager's offices. The third floor is copyists. And the roof is something very innovative for the times. It's a rooftop cafeteria and employees lunch area. So that you know, you're in these, the bowels of this building working in the vault. At lunchtime, you can come up on the roof and be out there in the light and air and you know, have a spectacular view of the city, I'm sure. It's very, it is funny how, how things come full circle because that's, that's like the rooftop amenity, at least in DC residential buildings nowadays, but also actually re, you know, retrofitted office buildings in downtown always have the rooftop garden, rooftop place to hold an after work cocktail party. So oh, yeah. Wyatt was, was, he was the harbinger, I suppose, of that. I don't know if he was the first, but he was certainly one of them. And it, it certainly was a wonderful, you know, wonderful touch to it. And I'm sure everybody appreciated. The public area of the building is the first floor. And this is the actual blueprints. And uh, the layout of it will be important when we talk about the murals and art program. Basically, you have a foyer at either end. And these are the main entrances that come off D Street here. And you would come in the building here. And then you would walk into the lobby. And the lobby is a little bit... Uh, Really, the foyers are more like we would think of a lobby today. And then the lobby here is like really kind of like, almost like you would have in a hotel. It's where you come in and you would, it's where you make contact and you do your business here at these desks, which are, you know, where the clerks sit. And what you would do is you'd, you'd request, you know, if you wanted to look at, let's, let's say your deed, you'd request your deed here. The deed would be the lever the deed was in would be brought up by elevator from the basement. And then you would go here into the reading room to look oh, at wow. it. Wow. The reading room is a spectacular room. It's huge and it has it's under a light well. Wow. So there's a, a light shaft that's you know three other stories tall. And these squares you see there are all panes and skylights. So it's lit by daylight. Uh, it, it's a very sophisticated use for the time of daylight as a reading aid. Um, and it, it's interesting that one of the, uh, some of the other buildings Wyeth built that are most notable during his tenure were the Georgetown and Petworth libraries. So he was, he was used to supervising library projects and, and to understand what the needs really were. And in many ways, the recorder building is also a library. Yeah, right, right. And uh, so it, it's, it's, it, it was a very successful design and it, it worked very well. And then when we walked into the lobby as the public, we weren't going to walk into just any lobby, were we? No, you weren't at all. And that's because even when you walked into the foyers, you saw them. That's because of its program of murals. And um, the murals are really quite unique. What the murals were, they were the last project of an organization called the, the Treasury Section of Fine Arts. And you have to remember, in these days, there was no General Services Administration to take care of civilian federal buildings. That didn't exist until 1949. The Treasury Department was in, in charge of all of them. And they were also in charge of all the post offices in the United States. So we don't think of that as a Treasury function today, but it was. And the supervisory architecture of the Treasury had, had enormous power and was in charge of an enormous number of buildings all over the United States. 
And one section of the, his office was the section of fine arts, uh, which was a New Deal program. It was started uh, under Roosevelt, had a number of different names, but it, uh, it was financed. They got 1% of the construction building of every federal project to decorate it. And the way that most of their, or a lot of their, the smaller projects, they just gave, to, you know, they, they assigned artists to like local, you know, small post offices. The larger ones were done by competition where there were, you know, a request was put out for designs and a jury of artists and section employees uh, judged the entries and they selected artists to execute the commissions. And remember the depression is just ending by this point. Uh, and, you know, artists are still not doing particularly well. This is, it's a big deal to have a competition like this and to win it, to be selected. Um, they're different. A lot of times people think these murals are done by the WPA, but that's not really true. The WPA was a project that was really at its heyday a little earlier in the 1930s. And its idea was to give employment to artists, however you could get it. And yes, the WPA did do some murals. They did more smaller paintings and smaller artwork. Uh, and they, they employed artists of all, you know, statures. The, the section of fine arts treasury competitions tended to attract established painters and artists with, uh, you know, some, some credentials of, of uh, exhibiting and, you know, having works in museums and those things. So it was very were different. There, were any of these artists African-American? Well, one was. But uh, to backtrack sort of how that happened, uh, Dr. Tompkins designed, he, he very much penned the specifications for all the murals. These were pre-planned for the building and they're put out there as the request solicitation for entries. And he planned every one of them. He selected seven events in uh, significance to African-Americans in American uh, history. How he selected the events is, is interesting. The events show they stress interracial cooperation, I would say, and they stress, often they stress events that had white heroes, but the, the African-Americans involved were just instrumental to the success of those events. They, the, they could not have succeeded without their participation. And that's, that's very much a, a, a theme of the murals. Uh, so there, there's that element to it. About five of the subjects Dr. Tompkins selected are military, or at least military connected events. Because remember, there's a war on, and the idea is unity and everybody pushing together to win it. And in 1942, the outcome is kind of in doubt. You know, it's it's the United States is not yet on the offensive really in 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 on any front, and so there's very much that element to them. Uh, so yes, to answer your question. Uh, of the selected, and there's a jury, Dr. Tompkins was on the jury, the head of the Howard University Art Department was on the jury. There was a mix of established artists and bureaucrats, and they selected the winning entries from rough sketches. And one of the artists, uh, William Edward Scott, whose work we'll see, was an established African-American uh, painter. And then the others were, were really quite a mix of people. Uh, at the time, it was hailed that uh, half the artists roughly are women, and the geographic distribution from all over the country, uh, artists from every place, and there's quite a variety of styles, as we'll see. Yeah, you can see that from here. From here, okay, this is this is all seven, but uh, we'll look at them in in individual. Yeah, you have some yeah individual shots of them as well, don't you? But uh, they they really do vary. Uh, but if, if we're ready, we can take a look at each one in turn very briefly. Yeah, let's and do. I have the locations where they were in the buildings and the murals serve, they're in the foyers too, as well as the lobby and in some of the other areas in the building. And they set the tone very quickly uh, that, you know, and they, they stress the uh, important role of African-Americans that's celebrated by the recorded building. And they, they try to engage you with, right when you walk in the door. They're not, they're not you know, in the library or the reading room. They're right there in the foyer okay. and through in the lobby. So uh, we'll start. This is the Battle of New Orleans by Ethel Magadan, Magafan. 
she was an interesting artist. She did some very major government bureau murals at the, the Senate and at the uh, Social Security Administration building, which now is Health and Human Services. This is a very large mural. It's about 14 feet long. And it shows Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. And he's being insisted by what are, you know, undoubtedly uh, enslaved persons who are piling cotton bales to shield, you know, the sharpshooters from the British. Um, Ethel Magafan, she was mostly based in Colorado. And she had a very interesting uh, artistic collaboration with her sister where they collaborated on a lot of paintings. And you really couldn't tell where one began and the other left off. Mm -hmm. This one she did do entirely by herself though. And she is among the more famous architects who have murals in the building. She was a fellow of the National Institute of Design and you know, had a very accomplished academic career. Uh, this is a, a more or less traditionally styled mural. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it looks like it, it's, in, it's in the style of a great many other murals that the treasury section did. And then there's one we know of someone that Washingtonians will be or should be familiar with, not a military subject, right? There's one of Benjamin Banneker. Absolutely. This is Benjamin Banneker. This is one of the most interesting murals. Uh, Maxine Sealbinder, who did it, this is one of two that really relate to the district as opposed to being national subjects. Benjamin Banneker, of course, uh, was really the, the person who surveyed for Andrew Ellicott when uh, they laid out the city of Washington. Maxine Sealbinder is an interesting artist. She was politically very progressive. She was from New York City and she published a lot of illustrations and uh, publications like New Masses and uh, you know others. And uh, she was quite political and had a lot of political associations uh, in New York. Later, she moved out to Hollywood and she designed nightclub sets uh, and she became Dean of the Art Department at UC uh, Long Beach and their gallery is named after her. She had a pretty long life. She died about 10 years ago. She's over a hundred. But her mural is very much in a mural tradition that uh, was popular, particularly in the thirties. It's kind of a proletarian, kind of a little bit cartoonish style that's designed to be vivid, to be on a wall outside, uh, grab people's attention. Diego Rivera is a real champion mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. His work is maybe a little more complicated than hers, but it, it's definitely of that school that it's it's supposed to be vivid and grab people's attention and very much, you know, a few major figures just re really grab people and uh, kind of energize them. And um, as we're very fortunate, the Smithsonian has a shot of Maxine Sealbinder actually yeah, painting wonderful. the mural. Yeah. And you, you can see how they did them, which is they did them at their home studio. She was in California. And they would paint them on, they, they would first go through an iterative process where, you know, the, they won the competition on the basis of a rough sketch. And then they would do increasingly into the, you know, larger and more complex uh, miniatures of the final mural that were called cartoons. And they would send each cartoon into Washington. And the section of fine arts would say, you're on the right track, go ahead, or you need to change this. And they would do three, maybe three cartoons during the course of the project, each one bigger. And the last one would be a dress rehearsal and the final okay, they would paint the final mural on linen, which you see here happening. Wow. That's and they would a send lot it. It's a lot of work. It's, a, it's a really a lot of steps in the process in the section as we'll see in one of the later examples, very, very hands-on and did not rubber stamp things. Wow. They were into the details. They were artists too, and they, they had a lot of, Comments, but at any rate, the artist would then send the final uh, mural on linen to Washington. They were responsible for paying to have it installed in the building under their contracts. And they hired somebody from New York to come and install them all. So the murals are painted on linen, but they're permanently affixed to the walls of the recorder's office. I mean, they're part of the building. They're not paintings that are hung in the building. Right. They're part of it. Right. So at any rate, there was Maxine Sealbinder and Benjamin Banneker. And then there was this. This yeah, is yeah, one of the most praised one. ones. Yeah, I adore this one. Another non-military subject. Uh, Austin Mecklen was an artist from the Hudson Valley of uh, New York State. And he was a magazine illustrator. Uh, and he did a very notable painting, a famous one that's in the Smithsonian Af uh, American Art Museum 
called Engine House and Breakers. He did a lot of industrial subjects, but this one is not. This is, of course, Matthew Henson, uh, who really was, I, th I think now today we recognize is really the person who got Robert Peary to the North Pole. It didn't happen without him um, right. helping plant, you know, the flag there. And those North of Pole. you who are in, who live in DC or are familiar with it, you will know that there are a couple buildings along the Anacostia River named in honor of Matthew Henson. Yes, he was, he was from Montgomery County, Maryland, I believe, uh, as, as was Perry. Um, and so he's, 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 he and Benjamin Banneker are two of the local figures who were up there. So then, um, at any rate, uh, this is another mural, uh, Colonel Shaw and his regiment at Fort Wagner, South Carolina, that has generated a lot of interest in the last couple of years. Carlos Lopez was born in Cuba and emigrated to the United States. And today he's recognized as a really pioneering Latino artist uh, in, in the United States. He was based in Detroit. He died very young from a stroke, just when he was really starting to catch on and be exhibited in museums. Last year, there was a university exhibit devoted to his work. And his son, John, is a big advocate for trying to preserve the murals in the recorder building, very active, and also is writing a book on his father's work. And this is this is one of the most dynamic and you know really active uh, subjects in, in in the recorder building. The charge at Fort Wagner was was very tragic. Most of Shaw's men were killed, and Shaw himself was fatally wounded. Uh, and this this commemorates not just Shaw, but really the sacrifice of the whole regiment of African-American troops. And then we have another African-American who is notable for the Revolutionary War, right? Yes, he is. And um, this is Crispus Attucks, who was uh, killed at the Boston Massacre. Uh, this is an interesting one. Herschel Levitt was a, a multi-talented artist. He was a painter, he was an illustrator, he was a photographer, he was a historian. He was an author, he was a muralist, and he was a graphics designer. And uh, his work has been exhibited at a lot of major museums, the Metropolitan and the Whitney in Manhattan. Columbia University has paintings in their collection, Chicago Institute of Fine Art, Boston Institute of Fine Art. One place though that perhaps people most experienced Levitt's work is he did a lot of covers for jazz albums in the 50s. A lot of those really adventurous abstract ones like the Pacific Jazz series that, uh, you know, Miles, he did a Miles Davis cover. He, um, he's a very talented graphics artist. Uh, you will see from a lot of these, a lot of them are like Chris Pesatics. They're very vibrant paintings, but the section of fine arts of the treasury department was very conservative. You don't see any abstract paintings mm -hmm. really at all. And there's no, you know, there, there are no cubists represented in any of the work the Treasury commissioned anywhere. Abstract art was a big no-no, um, even though Herschel Levitt did quite a bit of it. And Frederick Douglass is going to get his moment in a mural, isn't he? He gets a big moment here. And this is the mural by William Edward Scott, uh, who was, uh, a very established, he's among probably the most established artists of the seven winners of the competition. And he was, he was older. He was at this point, he was, I think in his sixties when he painted this. Uh, and he, he had been, uh, there's a military connection to this one because what Douglas is asking Lincoln to do and, and lobbying him to do is to allow African-Americans to serve in the Union Army. And of course, Douglas was successful in this. Uh, so we, we count this as a military related mural, although there's no nobody in uniform in it. But um, Scott was from Indianapolis and he was trained, he's very highly trained. He was from the he trained at the Art Institute of Chicago and he had done lived in Paris and studied there. And um, he was a very, very well known muralist of his times. He did more than 75 mural commissions, uh, a lot of them in Chicago and Indianapolis. He did a, uh, some notable murals for the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago. Um, and he uh, traveled to Haiti in the 30s and he did a lot of paintings which are not murals, but are considered very to be his finest work of people working in the cane fields and working in the sugar mills. So he was, he was a, quite an established and accomplished artist. Um, 
he generally, he was very adamant that his paintings should show not just uh, persons of color, not just in roles like slaves or servants, but that they would, would show them in, in positions of authority and responsibility and, and generally uh, not you know, limit them in the way that so many artists of the day did. And he was very successful. I think that there's a lot of uh, gravity is conveyed by this picture. Is it mm -hmm. very fitting to its subject and the kind of very somber hues it's pointed in? It's a very serious uh, painting. And uh, there, there have been several national exhibits of his work in the last few years too. And I think I understand there may be interest in one doing one at the Smithsonian American Art Gallery. Oh, excellent. So Peter, we're getting a little short on time. Okay. I know you're coming to the end, but we wanna make sure we have enough time for folks to ask some questions. Sure. Well, just very quickly, the final one is the Mortal Schweig uh, picture of Cyrus Tiffany at the Battle of Lake Erie. This is an interesting one that just because there's a big controversy about it, a conspiracy theory really, where take a look at this picture. Do you see what's, um, is there something odd about it to you? Well, I'll give you a hint. Look, Perry is holding his sword in his left hand. Okay. Not a big deal, but actually a huge deal because the section immediately sorted corresponding with Mortal Schweig and saying, why is the sword in his left hand? This is gonna make a problem. And as it turned out, Schweig had done an earlier post office mural in Kansas and it was attacked because it was erroneously stated by a poison pen letter, letter campaign that uh, all the wheat threshers were holding their scythes in their left hand and surely left hand, scythe, hammer and sickle. Oh my you goodness. All the, connect the dots. Wow. So there's wow. a big to do and there's a, quite a conflict between Schweig and the, the section saying, you know, uh, you know, are you sure he was left-handed? Well, you know, why does it matter and everything? And finally Schweig said, look, he's ambidextrous. We're just gonna leave it there. But the section did get a poison, a very racist poison pen letter from Schweig's hometown that's in their files that shows a, a photograph of the, of the cartoon of the picture with the holding sword left hand underlined in red pencil, red scythe, oh sword, left hand. Wow. It, was, it was basically, it was the idea there's a conspiracy theory in the mural. Meanwhile, that's completely upstaging the black man who's meant to be uh, honored recognized in this mural. Yes, it was It was bizarre. It, it's interesting, Cyrus Tiffany was actually about 75 years old at the time of the actual battle. He's shown a lot younger here, but uh, yes, it, it's it's strictly, it's all about, it's all about Commodore Perry's hands. And then uh, very quickly, William Edward Scott did one other picture. Uh, he was commissioned by Dr. Tompkins who wanted to preserve, you know, the moment of the groundbreaking and Roosevelt's participation. So we did this one groundbreaking day, which is in the recorder's office rather than the public areas of the building. Uh, it, it's a little notable because uh, Scott, I guess probably at the direction of other people, has people in the picture who weren't there and he moved the order of the people to get prominent people by Roosevelt. He moved the other people who were there, some of them to the back. Um, you know, artistic license, it's, it does commemorate the moment. And it's, it's a very kind of cheerful, open, you know, bright painting. Uh, finally, there's the Four Freedoms plaque. This was commissioned, perhaps not for the recorder building, but it was commissioned uh, from an African-American sculptor, Selma Burke. Roosevelt actually sat for it. Uh, it, it was kind of up in the air. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt didn't like the finished version of it and wanted to set up his third sitting for Burke with Roosevelt, but then he died. So they had to go with what she had. And it was dedicated in 1945. The recorder building because of the war was never formally dedicated. The plaque was just right after the war. Harry Truman came and he made a speech. It was two weeks after Hiroshima and you made a speech about nuclear annihilation, uh, which was very much in everybody's mind. But this was dedicated. This also has had a controversy because Burke believed that the Roosevelt dime, which was issued in 1946, was plagiarized from her design. Oh, There's wow. been a, a lot published about that. You can see it online. It's, it's never really been exactly resolved. There's a lot of argument pro and con. You can maybe be the judge yourself here. Um, but anyway, uh, that is kind of our whirlwind tour of the building. 
Uh, there's no way you can see any of the murals. As you see in Melissa's slide here on the right, they're covered over. The building's current thing is it was until last year, it was open, the roof was leaking like crazy. There's a lot of fallen plaster. Nobody is allowed in or out. We got these things, we got on the tour. I didn't go myself, but we got on the tour for the contractors who are gonna put a new roof on the building, which now has been done. I'm not showing all the fallen plaster and shambles of like the third floor because our focus is on the murals. Right. But nobody has seen them. They're, they're behind these plaster board or these particle boards. And you know what condition they're in, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah. Let's bring Melissa back with us. I want to say thank you, Peter. Um, folks, if you're not aware, one reason that Peter knows so much about this building is that he was instrumental in writing the nomination to historically designate the building as a District of Columbia historic site. And that kind of detailed, time-consuming work the DC Preservation League does all the time. And for tour guides like us at Washington Walks, I can't begin to tell you how invaluable that is because we use that information to tell the story of so many buildings that are on our walk routes um, that DCPL has had something to do with, usually to save them, or sometimes it's to point out that this building needs our attention. This building is in danger of being lost. Um, so I thank you both so much for the work that you do. And we want to have this last slide up and have Melissa come in as an actual employee. Peter is a trustee, but Melissa as an employee to really encourage folks who don't know about the organization yet, aren't members to be involved. Melissa can tell you how you can do that more specifically. I'm gonna to start to look at the chat for questions. All the proceeds from today's virtual experience we're gonna dedicate and we're gonna to donate to the DC Preservation League. So Melissa, tell us what we can do to be more involved. Thank you. Uh, first, I just wanna thank you so much, Peter. That was a really wonderful presentation. And I just also wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And thank you so much, Carolyn and Washington Walks for partnering with us and uh, for the very generous uh, donation that's coming from the proceeds of this program. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so I work as the programs associate for the DC Preservation League. Um, and I just wanna take the time today uh, just to encourage anyone interested in getting more involved uh, with DCPL that they can do so um, in a couple of ways. One is to become a member. Um, of the organization. So member support is so vital to our work um, and uh, our members' dedication to preservation is greatly appreciated. It really underwrites uh, our advocacy and what we're able to accomplish. Um, and members enjoy like benefits like early registration, discounted ticket prices for special events or more like members only um, exclusive programs. Um, so additionally, um, as Carolyn was mentioning, so DCPL members who want to be even more involved um, they have the opportunity to participate and volunteer on a, a few different committees that our organization runs. Um, so Peter is actually the chair of the Landmarks Committee and uh, just the bulk of the work of what, when it comes to like actually getting sites designated comes out of the Landmarks Committee. They're the ones who do all this amazing research. They're, these are the ones that are compiling the details to create a landmark nomination forms. They go and uh, present that to HPRB. So their work is so incredibly vital. And if you're interested in kind of getting involved in that kind of work, um, you can become a volunteer. Uh, we also have the education committee that I lead, uh, putting, helping to put uh, programs together, partnering with local organizations like Washington Walks. Uh, we also have like project review, government affairs and our development committees. Um, so we're always excited for new faces and uh, greatly appreciate all the hard work our volunteers put into preserving important places like the Recorder of Deeds building, um, and you can learn more about these opportunities and even sign up for like our e-newsletter to kind of stay informed of what we're doing on our website. Um, yeah, and we hope like you really consider joining us. Um, and uh, right here we have like our, our, um, our website, www.dcpreservation.org. You are more than welcome to email us with any questions that you might have. Um, we also have an app, DC Historic Sites. So it's geolocated. So if you're on a, a, a safe socially distanced walk, in the city and you want to see what's around you, uh, it's geolocated so you can kind of look at your phone and you can see what's around you and learn more. There's also like curated tours that we have on there. 
and there's also associated website and uh, the URL is there. And we're also on social media at DC Pres League. So you can kind of stay uh, informed there as well and, and follow us. So I just want to thank uh, Washington Walks again for this opportunity and all the wonderful work that you all are doing, um, partnering with us and also just sharing these wonderful stories about DC uh, with the community. So thank you guys again. Thank you so much. Peter, here's a fun question or here's just a share from Sally. My parents didn't give me a middle name when I was born, but when I was three, they took me downtown to, the regist to register my middle name, which they claim I approved. The building that I remember visiting at the time looked a lot like the Recorder of Deeds building. Is it possible that in its early years and in my early years, this building was also the Recorder of Names building? Hmm, that's an intriguing idea. I tend to think it was probably the municipal court building, which is on the opposite side of Judiciary Square. Uh, that's that's one where I, I think you would go for a name, you know, alteration. Uh, it's also is where I got married. So a lot of things happened over there. Uh, but I, I don't know the recorder's office would have been the place, but I, I can't definitely say no. So Sarah has a couple um, things to share or ask. Interesting to learn that the fees that the Recorder of Deeds collected supported its work. That's the way it still works. Hence, land records get digitized only as enough money is collected to pay for these. As of yet, no deeds before 1921 have been digitized. Correct. Which is it's sort of- very frustrating. Yeah. They're, they're, they're over DC archives, which of course been closed since the pandemic started really. Uh, in the big levers there, the older ones. Sarah also wonders, what was the function of the DC police court? That was, basically that dealt with like misdemeanors and there were a ton of them in the 1920s. If you think about it, that's when automobile ownership exploded. So, you know, everything from drunk driving to parking tickets. And then it was prohibition too. So like, you know, just simple possession of alcohol you know, being scraped up drunk out of the street and getting a ticket for it. You had to go down there and answer the tickets. So it was, they actually, had, in the twenties, they had so many people in a typical day in the old police court building, they couldn't sit down. Wow. So people had to stand like eight, 10, 12 hours. Sometimes they collapsed. It, it was anarchy. I mean, it was like really terrible. Oh my gosh. So Sarah's also sharing, this is, I love this. This is kind of double meeting for maybe sites along the Anacostia River. The Henson sites east of the Anacostia may be named for Tobias Henson, an early black landowner whose many descendants still lived there in the early 1940s. And I was thinking of the Matthew Henson um, in like environmental education or earth, earth conservation core buildings. Yes. One that's near Nats Park and that one now is in Southwest or still in Southwest um, tucked in there now, hanging in there with Audi Field and all that other mixed use development looming around it. But so glad to know about Tobias and his legacy as well. Well, interesting that we actually have a landmarks nomination going for that. Uh center there by Nats Park out there in the river. Uh, I don't know, the pumping station for Capitol Hill. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I've always assumed that that, that you know, that it was Matthew Henson, Henson that was named for, for his role in exploration. Yeah, yeah, those buildings are, are for him with Earth, Earth Conservation yeah. Corps, but I love this connection to Tobias Henson, who I'm not familiar with. Me neither, that's, that's you learn something new. Thank you, Sarah. Mary Ann says, I was in the building before it closed and asked about a statue in the lobby of a young man clothed in only jeans pants and told that it was Abraham Lincoln and had originally been at Old City Hall. Uh, I don't think it actually was at Old City Hall, but yes, that's correct. There's a very stylized art deco kind of statue of, it's a plaster cast actually of an original that was done for the 1939 World's Fair in San Francisco. Um, not the New York one, the West Coast one, by an artist named Hansen. And it's, it's a very, it's an it's, it's a incredibly buff statue of Lincoln. I mean, yeah. it's amazing. I think that might be at the DC archives now. Okay. Um, that, to have been moved over there. I'm not positive of that, but they have one that's either its twin or that statue. 
And, you know, this might be a good opportunity to say that right now in 2021, the building that is sort of in or the function that's a bit in danger and fragile and vulnerable, like the recorder was before it got its building in 1941, mm. is definitely the DC Archives building. Tell folks a little bit about that building and that function who may not be familiar with it. Oh, yes. The, well, the, the DC Archives is in a, a converted livery stable in Blagden Alley. Uh, you know, which is like over, you know, roughly, you know, off of M and N streets. Um, and it, it, it's a very big building and it was a good idea, but it's not a climate controlled building. And it, you know, obviously wasn't built as a, uh, a repository. So it, it suffers quite a bit. And there's been a, for years, there's been a rumor or, you know, an effort really to build a, a more proper archives building, even to the purpose of point of wanting to repurpose the recorder building for that function. Yeah. For a variety of reasons that the, you know, the recorder building is kind of, it, it's right by the courthouse. There, there's a little pushback from that, that ultimately somebody might want to use it as offices for the court system instead. So it, it's like people won't let go of it, but they also won't fix it. But yeah. the DC archives definitely is in need of some help there. For sure, for sure. Peter, thank you again for spending this time with us and thank you for the work, the volunteer work that you do for this organization that is so integral to our city's built environment being preserved, interpreted, and celebrated. Thank all of you for joining us today. We have one virtual experience left for um, this year's Black History Month. Next Saturday, we're gonna do something completely different. It won't be about a building, but it's gonna be about people. It's gonna be about Dolly Madison and the Madison enslaved with particular focus on a female enslaved called Suki, who was Mrs. Madison's sort of ladies maid. And we're gonna take a unique approach because we're gonna be talking with two living history uh, performers or interpreters, one who has does Dolly Madison and one who does Suki. And they're gonna talk with us about what they learned about the Madisons and the enslaved doing research and how they present these figures to a 21st century audience. So join us, we'll send an email out about that program um, on Monday or Tuesday. In the meantime, happy birthday, Frederick Douglass. Happy birthday, Abraham Lincoln yesterday. Peter, thank you again. And thank you thank all you. for joining us. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.